run from hell. But feeding underwater poses special problems. On land, a predator can bite its prey, brace itself against the ground, then pull its victim down using the force of gravity. Eating flesh underwater can be a big problem because your prey simply floats away. Ichthyosaurs had one solution. They would open their mouths very rapidly and that would create a vacuum and suck the fish in. If you're eating bigger prey, as sharks do today, you have to sink your teeth in and twist to tear chunks of flesh off, sometimes turning the body like a great corkscrew. Sometimes there would be a great tussle between the predator and the prey, and during the battle some of the sea monsters broke their collarbones and they healed up again during life. Are these Jurassic killers still prowling Loch Ness? If so, these Scottish waters may be the most dangerous place in the world to go fishing. It was dusk on a summer's evening in 1934 when a local chauffeur, Alfred Cruikshank, was driving along the hazardous north bank of Loch Ness. As he crested a small hill, his headlights picked out a large animal crossing the road ahead. Later, he reported seeing a large humped body standing four feet high with its belly trailing on the ground. He thought it was about 25 feet long. It waddled away from the road on two legs on each side. Its head, he said, was close to its body with very little neck. Well, is this just another tall tale, or did Cruikshank see something real? Were there really 25-foot-long sea monsters? 200 years ago, a large skull was found in a quarry in Holland, and it caused quite a stir. This fossil of a monster called Mosasaur was so famous that at the Battle of Maastricht in 1795, Napoleon was ordered to deliver it to Paris, to Baron Georges Cuvier, the leading paleontologist of the day. The battles at sea rivaled the battles on land among paleontologists and philosophers. In the 18th century, the prevailing view was that the Earth was only a few thousand years old, and the concept of extinction didn't exist. Cuvier showed that millions of years ago, giant reptiles roamed the seas, then vanished. Their fossils proved they once existed. In a warehouse in North Dakota, Mike Trebold is assembling a monster mosasaur. Rescued from a museum basement after more than 100 years, he put it together in double quick time, especially for this film. It's the largest mosasaur ever found. There's the 10 foot mark right there. Okay, there's the 22 foot mark. 31 feet. Forty-five feet, three inches. Even Mike Trebold is impressed. From the tip of the snout to the back of the rear jaw, six feet, three inches. And each of the teeth are about three inches long. Well, I wouldn't make much more than a quick snack to one of these. <laughs> one of the world authorities on mosasaurs is Gordon Bell of the South Dakota School of Mines. The tail of the mosasaur was the main propulsive organ. It was moved from side to side like a modern eel swims, and that gave it a great deal of thrust and power, which made it an excellent ambush predator. The limbs are used mainly for steering. The front limbs especially were used for steering right or left, up or down, while the hind limbs were used to bring the body into line to control pitch and yaw, much like a modern airplane. The lower jaw has a joint right in the middle 
and at the back there is a rotating hinge. In the front there is a very loose tendinal connection and this allows the lower jaw to flex inwards and backwards and that would force the food right down the animal's throat. The Mosasaur is an ancestor of the Komodo dragon. It's believed they crawled onto the land to lay their eggs, but like sea turtles, their paddles would not have been able to lift their massive bodies off the ground. However big and fierce the adult Mosasaurs were, the young would have been very small and defenseless. So perhaps the mother Mosasaur would have crept into a small secluded bay just like this to lay her eggs. If a Mosasaur could waddle on land, it could have been the creature that Alfred Cruikshank thought he saw in 1934. But another contender with a long neck would become the most famous Loch Ness monster of them all. On the afternoon of June the 1st, 1994, Fiona Mackay and her friend Errol David were driving along the lake when they thought they saw something. They raced off to try to get a closer look. It had a long neck and was moving swiftly in the water. They followed it for about 100 yards when suddenly it dove, they said, with such a splash and disturbance that they had to jump back to stop from being soaked. That night, others also saw it. A long neck is the most common feature reported. The description fits another Jurassic sea dragon, Plesiosaurus, also first uncovered in the limestone cliffs at Lyme Regis. Mary Anning was 25 years old when she made her second important discovery. It was on a bitter December morning in 1823 after winter storms had battered the coast, that Mary went out as usual, blind to the dangers of these treacherous cliffs. There, she found a complete skeleton of the animal that would make her famous. Her achievements as a, an adult were even more extraordinary than her childish achievements, in my opinion. The most extraordinary in the world of science was her discovery of the world's first complete plesiosaur, this wonderful marine reptile with an enormously long neck. And it was such an extraordinary discovery that drawings were sent of it that she had made to Paris where the world's expertise existed. And the Parisian experts said this was a forgery. They suspected that these collectors were forging fossils, corrupting the scientific record. And when um, an ordinary working class girl was shown to be correct and the world's leading scientists were shown to be wrong, that gave her a credibility which she never lost. And nobody ever after in the remaining 24 years of her life checked or, or questioned her find. She was uh, an enormously authoritative figure. Like St. George, Mary Anning had slain the mythical dragon. Now she too would enter the realm of legend and become known as St. Georgina of Lyme Regis for her discoveries proving the existence of ancient reptiles. Her plesiosaur once swam the oceans growing to a length of over 40 feet. Jim Martin, head paleontologist at South Dakota School of Mines, has studied how they move through the water. This is the front paddle of this long necked plesiosaur. You can see that it's quite narrow, yet the relatively long. This particular paddle was used to sort of fly through the water, flying in a way much that penguins do. 
certainly not as fast. This animal was much slower in the water than penguins and really was much more of an ambusher than a speed demon to go out and catch its prey. One curious feature of plesiosaurs, they swallowed stones. Over 250 of these stones were found in the stomach of this giant plesiosaur. The stones were probably used for a number of purposes, one for ballast to keep this plesiosaur upright while it's swimming, and the other for processing food by grinding it up. Its long neck was also peculiar. Any movement of its head and the animal would veer off course. But it also had the advantage that its head could encounter a school of small prey before its body was detected. Ambush by stealth meant no creature was safe from a surprise attack. Plesiosaurs had no sense of smell, but like sharks, they could taste the slightest quantity of blood in the water. Its two nostrils acted like stereoscopic vision, giving the animal a precise readout of the location of its prey. An organ behind its nostrils then locked onto the position. It also told the animal how fast it was going while in pursuit, and two other organs in its head controlled pitch and yaw. Plesiosaurs were superbly suited for the primordial sea. Stranger and more terrifying than any creature in legend, they flourished for over a hundred million years. Could an ancient sea monster still be alive?